So, dear students, keep on. We are we are back to chemistry. The title of this lesson is acids, bases, and salts. Hmm? Why are we? Please sh sh shut up. Sorry for being so direct. <laughs> Please keep uh, silence. The, why are we getting uh, busy with acids, uh, bases, and salts? Yeah, because now we have got the concept of equilibrium. And uh, this lesson is about what happens to acids, bases, and salts in aqueous solutions. And so we have all the uh, tools to understand this after the lessons we had on thermodynamics and kinetics. And as you know, there are so many issues related to acid and bases that are essential for chemists, like the pH value that need to be addressed uh, in the theory. Fine, so we move on with this. There is a definition of electrolytes that are uh, anything that dissolves in water by splitting into ions. You may have something that dissolves in water without doing that, and that is not an electrolyte. For instance, every day you take, uh, when you take a coffee, you dissolve sugar into water, basically. Dirty water, we call the American coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but it's water. And you put that uh, in that sugar. Sugar is not dissolving by splitting into iron. The molecules of sugar get into solution as they are, leaving the solid state, the crystal of sugar, and going into water. But when you have splitting into ions, then you have an electrolyte. This is by definition. And this is important also for next week's lessons on electrochemistry, because electrochemistry deals with the behavior of electrolytes in water and many other things that you will learn. <clears throat> we divide the world of electrolytes into two big categories. We are going to see uh, on and on in this lesson. One is the strong and the other is the weak electrolytes. What is the difference? A strong electrolyte dissolves completely into ions. Any bit of it splits into ions. The weak electrolytes dissolve only partially. Which means that if you put the molecules, several molecules, into water, only a fraction of them become a product based on ions. In this case, you have the case of acetic acid that splits into the hydrogen ion and the acetate ion. That is only partial. So in the water, you will have some unsplitted molecules of acetic acid, along with some acetate ions and some hydrogen ions. This is because weak electrolytes obey equilibria. An equilibrium is set, you remember now and you know now, when a direct reaction is accompanied by a reverse reaction forward and backward. So whenever you have ions of this uh, acetate and proton, some of them tend to recombine and form a molecule of acetic acid. As long as molecules of acetic acid uh, split into the, the, these two ions. So an equilibrium is set. It's always a dynamic concept. But from a practical viewpoint, it is like having a partial dissociation. What kind of bonds do characterize 
electrolytes? Well, two kinds of bonds. The ionic bond is rather obvious. It is generally the case uh, of uh, strong electrolytes, like uh, sodium chloride. These ionic bond-based um, compounds split into a positive and a negative ion. And you remember, each one of them undergoes a solvation process. The water molecules get attached. Literally, they solvate the ions by exposing to the ions the part of their dipoles that has an opposite charge. So if you have a positive ion, like Na+, the water molecule get in contact with it by exposing the oxygen. Because the oxygen has two couples of electrons, so the negative part of the uh, water molecule is there, and the positive is close to the protons. And this keeps the ion isolated and within the water. Hmm? If you have the other ion, like the chloride ions, then are the hydrogen are going close to the chloride ions to, as attracted by its negative charge. But still you have water that surrounds the ions and bring them into the solution and splits the electrolyte completely. So ionic bonds generally are associated to strong electrolytes, generally. But also molecules like uh, hydrochloric acid, that is uh, based on a um, covalent bond, because the difference in electronegativity between chlorine and hydrogen is not high enough by definition to give you a ionic bond. You remember the difference in electronegativity should be, depending on the books, you get 1.7 or 1 1.9. Uh, you, you need a bond. But in this case, it's only 1.4, 1.3, depends on also what you get as the electronegativity of hydrogen. Yeah? So it's, it's a covalent bond. Of course, it is a polar covalent bond. And this is the reason why when hydrogen chloride, that is a strong acid, is one of the strongest acids, gets into water, it splits. And one proton goes and interacts with the water molecule to form this complex ion, which is called hydronium. This is something you're going to see so many times in this lesson. And a negative standing alone chloride ion. <clears throat> this brings me to tell you that you don't find actually protons in water, hydrogen ions in water. You always find them combined with a water molecule. What happens is this. Let's use the Lewis notation. And you have water written like this in contact with, uh, with uh, oxygen. You have a couple of electrons here. One is coming from hydrogen. One is coming from oxygen. You have a couple of electrons here, the same. And you have two spare couples of electrons, uh, two spare, two uh, couples of electrons not belonging to any bond. When a proton is present in, the, in contact with water, coming from a molecule that splits, it does not stand alone. It is going to establish a sort of dative covalent bond. You remember dative covalent bonds? It's when 
the shared electrons are both coming from one of the counterparts. In this case, these two electrons are given to establish a bond with this hydrogen <coughs> ion. As a consequence, the charge becomes belonging to the entire uh, complex that is formed, the entire molecule, I would say, that is formed. The only point is that it has a positive charge <clears throat> because it's coming from the uh, proton. Hmm? So it becomes like this, oxygen with three bonds with hydrogen and a positive charge. This is the hydronium ion. So you will not find protons standing alone. There is so much water and so many occasions to interact through a dative covalent bond. So, but this does not mean that we don't use the simple notation of H plus because if there is a direct correspondence between H plus and the hydronium ion. But in a way, it's more correct, and especially it is only, uh, uh, it's real to uh, see it as an hydronium ion, as like, as it is like this. Hmm? Fine. Here you have some examples of strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Uh, generally, the salts are uh, often strong electrolytes, so they are, co those, especially those that are easily dissolved in water. Some acids are strong electrolytes, so they completely dissolve in water, like hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, despite it can deliver two protons per molecule. So, you will see that in case of polyprotic acids, which means that I have more than one proton delivered, in spite of having two, it actually delivers both of them to the solution. It splits completely. And also some bases like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. These are strong bases. We will see what strong is and how can it be more scientifically defined, quantify, uh, quantified. Um, uh, other acids uh, um, are weak or bases are weak, like cyanidric acid. <clears throat> this is... Um, actually very weak, very weak, um, which means that it splits only a little in water. Um, it may be interesting, but not, uh, don't, don't do any experiment, uh, to know that this is um, uh, used for uh, executions in the US what was used like for, for these kind of purposes, uh, death penalties. Hmm? Basically, uh, in these cases, uh, you start from um, salt like potassium uh, cyanide, um, which is a crystalline thing in a beaker. And when you start the process, which is something that I will, uh, I, I do not uh, understand, but uh, it happens in the US, it is like that, and in many other countries. Drops, uh, this is the KCN, the, the solid, drops of sulfuric acid are delivered over the cyanide. Um, when this becomes a solution, since this is a very strong acid, it forces the protons to combine with the cyanide. And since the cyanidric acid is a weak acid, it is completely pushed to form HCN. This is what happens. HCN desorbs from this uh, solution and gets 
uh, inhaled by the people, the, the person that is executed, and it blocks the muscles of the art in a few seconds. So it's very dangerous. Well, if you do not want to refer to such a sad use, you may also um, consider that cyanides, like this one, are used in the metallurgical treatment in order to have, uh, mm, I don't remember exactly the, the English term, but you have a treatment that strengthens, strengthens the material. It is by, after forming a metal material, you put it into uh, fused salts based on cyanides, and it gets uh, tempered, I think, or something like that. Hmm? Um, these salts, based on cyanide, ha ha have to be handled with care. Because if they find among the various waste waters of a company an acidic wastewater, then the cyanides turn into, into cyanidric acid and it is desorbed. Because it is a weak acid, you need just a few protons, more than the neutral condition, in order to push it back to molecules of cyanidric acid, which are extremely toxic. You understand this? Yes. So no surprise, it is a weak acid because of these uh, problems. It's very dangerous stuff. Also, when you use it for um, production purposes. Hmm. Hydrofluoric acid is also rather weak. And we have already seen the acetic acid as a weak acid. As for the basis, uh, the basis uh, ammonia is uh, not the strongest base. It's not that weak. You know that because it's uh, bringing pH to above above the above 10. But in any case, you can feel it as a strong basis. Uh, you use it, for instance, to wash something in your house because it's also getting everything sterile. It's going to clean out every bacteria because it's changing so much the pH, bringing it to basic uh, levels that the bacteria die. Hmm? You know. And uh, this is the how it looks ammonia, how ammonia looks when it is in water because uh, it, ammonia is like this. But when it gets into water, it immediately forms a ammonium ion and an hydroxyl ion, which is this. Okay, <clears throat> let's introduce this parameter here. That is the dissociation grade. Oh, I will turn back to dissociation grade or ionization of your acid or base uh, of the acid or the base that you are considering. Mm? It is the number of dissociated molecules divided by the original molecules. So you have 100 molecules and you put them in water. How many of them do dissociate? Alpha. It's a sort of percentage, a fraction of molecule that do dissociate. So it's, by definition, varying between 0 and 1. If no dissociation takes place, you put a rock in the water, it does, nothing happens. <laughs> Then there is uh, non-electrolytic behavior. If, and the, or you put sugar. Also sugar does not dissociate, but it dissolves. So if you have uh, alpha equal to 1, you have complete dissociation. And this is typical of strong electrolytes, as we saw. In between situations are typical of weak electrolytes. That do dissociate, but not complete, completely. Here are some uh, examples of acids and bases and some of their uses. Hmm? Let's go through that because it's uh, relaxing us a bit after so many definitions. Acetic acid, it is uh, used for flavoring. 
Hmm? Especially, I was uh, tasting a few days ago something that reminded me of the of England. It uh, chips based on salt and vinegar. Hmm? If you go to England, uh, you you get them. When I was <laughs> younger than you are, <laughs> I was uh, going uh, to England to get some uh, English <laughs> with some of these schools, summer schools. And always they, when I wanted to have the chips, they go salt vinegar. They were asking you this thing. So it's used for, as you know, for flavoring. Hmm? But it's also used to preserve foods. We call them carpione. I absolutely don't know what is the word in English. But in Italy, we put zucchini under vinegar. And the acidic nature of vinegar preserves them. Because not so many bacteria can survive such a pH, such an acidic nature. So you offset a bit with the pH, the neutral conditions, normal tap water, and this makes hard, life hard for bacteria. Okay, you can eat it. If you eat too much, you become, <laughs> it is not good for you. But for the bacteria, it's like if you were swimming in an acetic acid pool. It's not nice. You may get some carpione, which is not, not bad. But this is done for this purpose. In the African country, you use a lot of, uh, it's not paprika, it's spices, heavy spices. We used in Piedmont to use salt from the sea in Liguria, if you go there uh, for fun. The fish was taken through the maritime Alps through Piedmont up to Europe, it was kept under salt. So there are several ways. In any kind of this way, sometimes you get water out of that. You get them completely dry, like the fish in Portugal. Hmm? OK, in any case, with these additions, you offset normal conditions so you get the food Difficult to be attacked by microorganisms. Citric acid is used for flavoring. It is in the Coca-Cola, which is something that I have to mention because I'm paid by Coca-Cola for this. <laughs> uh, but it, you know that. It's, it's present several, uh, in several of the beverages. Phosphoric acid is used. It's also present in Coca-Cola, if I'm not wrong. But uh, it's used to clean the rust out of uh, the iron. Um, then uh, boric acid, it's very popular in my house in these uh, years because it's used to clean the little kids. Hmm? It's a delicate disinfectant, hmm? boric acid. Um, Salts of aluminium, and you see, may say, but well, if it is a salt, why is it mentioned as an acid? Then we will learn it on Friday at the end of the second part of this lesson. But I may anticipate that the salts are products, you may see them as product of combination of acids and bases. If a salt comes from the combination of a strong acid and a weak base, when dissolved, the strong acid nature becomes evident and it lowers the pH, which means it gets the environment acid. If it is the other way around, it will get the environment slightly basic. In this case, <coughs> the aluminum, <coughs> sodium aluminum sulfate is clearly coming from a weak base, the hydroxide of sodium, or, or better, of aluminum, and a strong acid, sulfuric acid. So that's the reason why it provides acidity to the solution. Hydrochloric acid used at home to clean the tiles. OK, some of the bases. Um, when you have an oven uh, dirty, because you cooked something that 
sprayed here and there some sauce or greases uh, from taken from the food. You use basic detergents, and if you want to be strong, you use sodium hydroxide. Ammonia is also used for cleaning purposes. It smells a lot, and you can feel when it has been used to clean. You can perceive just four parts per million of ammonia molecules in, in air with your nose. It's a very strong odor. Then sodium carbonate is also used for cleaning or to soften soften uh, the water. What does it mean? It means that it helps to lower the calcium and magnesium concentration. Huh? The water hardness is related to calcium and magnesium. It's not good to drink them, that hard water, because it will bring stones in your kidneys easily. Uh, sometimes you have to treat it, and you treat it by those means, which are bringing about precipitation of calcium carbonate, and so it gets out of the water. Look at this. Sodium bicarbonate, or hydrogen carbonate, that is very popular. It is the chemical. Uh, it's the chemical uh, yeast. A yeast, a lievito in Italiano. Eh? Yeast. It's the the old yeast used by bakeries are microorganisms that, when the thing is baked, do eat part of the amides or or the sugars present in your. Uh, cake and produce CO2, which inflates the stuff and generates this blowing up of your cake. It, this process can be done chemically with no living beings. So if you are an animalist, <laughs> you're not going to kill anything this mean, by this means. You are using the so-called baking soda which is this uh, sodium, uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate, that with temperature, so when the cake is being baked, decomposes and, pro and produces CO2 by thermal decomposition. <clears throat> this is also used as a mild anti-acid, so you, it gets your stomach a bit, uh, a bit better. Or it's used also to clean the vegetables. Well, on, uh, old uh, recipe by your grandmother uses this uh, product. Um, uh, sodium phosphate is the last uh, recalled, and it is used to clean before uh, applying paintings over surfaces. So you see that acids and bases are used in everyday life, so they are not something that can be, uh, can be discarded and not considered in this course. And now, let's start. We have defined the electrolyte and what is a strong or a weak one. We have defined the dissociation degree, which helps. And now we define what is an acid and what is a base. And you will see that Several researchers have provided different definitions. Some one, some of this definition is rather, uh, rather uh, narrow. Some of these are rather broad. Well, we have to understand a bit more. The Arrhenius theory. We have already seen what Arrhenius did in the kinetics area. So he discovered the, the formula that governs the dependency versus temperature of the kinetic constant. You remember that. But he also provided a definition. And he stated that an acid is a substance that generates directly protons, hydrogen ions, 
in water. And a base is a substance that generate hydroxyl ions. Hmm? So <clears throat> those uh, st strong acid and bases generate directly and completely, by complete dissociation, protons, the strong acid, and hydroxyl ions, the strong bases. The weak acid and bases only partially generate them. But you see, this definition is fitting perfectly these examples. But for instance, it does not uh, fit the ammonia case. We will see later. Look at this. If you are attending my lessons with, uh, let's say, memory, I was using this as um, when I was a kid as a can uh, um, a canoe. Huh? That that is exactly what I did. I put a cork over heat. The hydrogen was piling up and poosh, it was shooting the cork out. This is exactly the experiment. Actually, I was a bit more perverted because I wanted more surface for hydrogen, for zinc, and not just the lamina, but I was putting grinded zinc, so have more surface of zinc reacting with hydrochloric acid, which is nice because also the, the droplets are, are providing additional weapons <laughs> because they are corroding the the soldiers of the opposed army. <laughs> anyway, you can see from the difference of the behavior between a strong and a weak acid that <clears throat> having more protons or better hydronium ions, you remember that, in the solution as a consequence of a fully splitting acid like hydrochloric acid compared to a only partially splitting acid like the acetic acid boosts the reaction between protons and zinc more so that you have this This reaction, 2 plus. OK. Oh, no, this is bad. Uh, this is my mistake. OK. Protons, 2 plus zinc metal gives hydrogen bubbles, pushing the cork out, plus zinc in the solution. OK? <coughs> if you have a strong acid, one molar is the same. So you put the same amount of molecules in both cases. If you have a strong cases, a strong acid, you generate directly as many hydronium ions as moles of hydrochloric acid, you put it there inside. So you generate a lot. If you have a weak, you only generate a fraction of it. And having a different concentration of protons in the solution pushes this reaction in a different way. Is this, think about that, a kinetic or a thermodynamic push? What is thermodynamics about? The feasibility or not of a process. Thermodynamics tells you if a process can happen or not. Remember that. Kinetics tell you how fast does it happen. In this case, why do you see much more bubbles because it shifts an equilibrium or because it boosts a reaction kinetically? Of course, I will provide the answer. I don't know. No, yes, I know. <laughs> because 
kinetically it boosts the reaction. This is a reaction that in both cases, if you have enough acid, is going to bring all the zinc in the solution. In this case, it's a so-called sudden death. In this case, it takes a while. But the reason is that in the second case, on the right-hand side, you have much less protons because the acid is weak. Be careful. It is weak. But as long as the protons are consumed by this reaction, other protons are generated because they disappear. And so, OK, it is an equilibrium, that of the dissociation of the acetic acid. But it's going to go on, because you are subtracting one of the products of the dissociation. So it's a never-ending story. It's going to eat all the zinc. But it takes more time, because it's going kinetically slower, because you have less protons. And at the end of the story, you need the protons to go and hit against the zinc lamina, the zinc foil, of course. And this is happening statistically less frequently in the right-hand case compared to the left-hand case, just because there are much less protons. So it's a matter of... Uh, Amount. Hmm? So it's a kinetic reason. The less the protons, the less are the hits of protons against zinc. And you need protons to hit the zinc to exchange, you see here, electrons and bring the zinc as ion in the solutions to corrode the zinc metal. I hope that was clear. And it, this is just an example how on how, of how these definitions do reflect in different behaviors in everyday life. <clears throat> what I told you, ammonia, you look at it and you see, well, it has a lot of protons. I suppose it is going to lose at least one of them and behave like an acid if I want to follow the Arrhenius definition. What is the Arrhenius definition? An acid is a substance that when you put it in water, it splits and provides protons. That is the Arrhenius definition. But ammonia, that has a lot of protons, just do the opposite. This is what happens with ammonia. Instead of giving protons, it gets protons. And to get them, it even splits the water molecule. Let's go back to the Lewis notation. How many electrons are there in the valence shell of, uh, of nitrogen? Well, nitrogen has got seven electrons, but only five are in the valence shell, because two are in the 1s orbital that is in the core. It's two inner, look, it's two and inner location to get involved in chemical reaction. That is something that we have learned so many times, uh, time ago, some time ago. So it exchanges, and three of its valence electrons with three hydrogen atoms, like this, to form ammonia. But it has a free couple of electrons. So when it gets <coughs> dissolved in water, it does this job. It takes one proton out of the water molecule, establishing a dative bond and becoming a 
this ammonium ion with a positive charge, leaving hydrogen and oxygen along with a negative charge. This is what happens. So let's go back to the original. You see what happens here. At the end of the story, it takes a proton and sort of generates, even if indirectly, an hydroxyl ion. So indirectly, it behaves like an Arrhenius base. Because when it gets into water, it delivers. But it's not direct. So it's not what Arrhenius was thinking. So this requires a broader definition. And this is exactly what Brunsted and Lowry provided. And they said, an acid is a substance that is capable of donating one or more protons. And so far, it's OK. No difference with the Arrhenius theory. But a base is a substance cap capable of receiving one or more protons, which is different. And this is the case of ammonia. You think you see it here. Ammonia is this originally and becomes this. Gets a proton. It even takes it out of a water molecule because it's easy, it's really eager to get it. This <clears throat> brings about another consequence. Think of hydrochloric acid. <clears throat> you see the chlorine and the hydrogen bond through a polar covalent bond. It's not ionic compound. It gets into water. It is a gas, by the way. It gets into water, it gets dissolved, and forms an aqueous solution of hydrochloric acid. Okay? It is an acid, and water, in this case, behaves like a base. We never even thought of addressing water as a base according to the Arrhenius theory. But according to the Bronsted, the broader Bronsted and Lowry theory, it be behaves like a base because as soon as the hydrochloric acid gets into water, it gives a proton. And where does this proton go? To the water. And you remember, it forms this hydronium ion. It's strange, but water, in the presence of a strong acid like hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid, behaves like a base. And this theory, since this can be, in a way, also seen as a, something that can go back to the original, associate acids to related bases, and bases to related acid. You may see couples. And we will see so many of these related uh, counterparts in the next uh, slides. And you may see them in the rows of this list. What is this list about? Is the list that is establishing a ranking among different acids in this column. The strongest are on top. The weakest are at the bottom. But as you see, if you go directly towards the right, you will see the associated base. A strong acid generates a very weak base. 
the strength of an acid goes in a direction that is the, exactly the opposite of the strength of a base. Here you see that the strongest bases are the hydroxyl ion, for instance, the phosphate ion. Ammonia is there. And uh, even stronger are the O2 minus ions. But this is the way Brunsted and Lowry address the bases. We are we have been telling we we were we were saying before that sodium hydroxide is a base because when it gets into water it delivers OH minus. Well, according to Brunsted and Lowry, OH minus is a base because it gets easily a proton to do what to go back to water. Okay? So you understand now it's a broader definition. And you also understand that sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, okay, are different compounds. But when they dissolve in water, they generate the same base, the OH minus ion, the hydroxyl ion. That is, according to Bronsted and Lowry, the true base, the ion that gets protons easily. Hmm? So, okay, these are looking at semantic things, but, okay, <laughs> I have to tell them to you. Eh? These are definitions, unfortunately, to be known. I was trying to uh, describe things before with my own drawings that are always awful, but here are more clear, maybe clearer, I think. Um, Hydrochloric acid is providing hydrogen to water that behaves like a base and forms hydronium, the hydronium ion. Hmm? This is ammonia that behaves like a base because it gets a proton from water. And in this other case, water is behaving like an acid. Well, is water a base or an acid? It can show both behaviors. It depends on the molecule it interacts with. Those molecules that may exhibit either a basic or an acid behavior are called amphoter. And the behavior is called amphoteric behavior. We will see other examples. So once again, this is exactly what we have seen before with the representation of the molecules written with formulas, chemical equations. In the first case, water behaves like a base because it gets a proton. In the second, water behaves like an acid because it gives a proton. To exhibit a behavior like a base, it needs a strong acid. To exhibit a behavior like an acid, it needs a rather strong base, which is this last case. According to this definition, when, you, when an acid displays its acidity, you have always a base that gets the proton. And it's the other way around. So you form always what can be defined as a conjugated pair between a base and an acid. And look at reaction number two to get back to some thrilling experience. No, this is, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to go here. This is what I told you before. You start from a cyanide. You put droplets of an acid that is stronger. 
And by the way, from this equilibrium, you understand that cyanidric acid is even weaker than acetic acid. Because if you put droplets of acetic acid, you push the equilibrium to the right, to the formation of cyanidric acid that is going as a gas and is exhibiting this very uh, toxic behavior. OK? So you put an, an acid, and the other one behaves like a base, gets a proton and gets out of the solution as a gas. gas. OK? <clears throat> this is something that we have already seen. This is just to recall it. OK. <clears throat> And now, let's introduce the broadest definition possible. Once again, we have someone back on track. Lewis, the one of the notation. What did he say? He said, in very general terms, a base is a compound that gives a couple of electrons. And an acid is a compound that accepts a couple of electrons. So we are not talking any longer about protons, hydroxyl ions. We are just talking about couples of electrons. In this sense, we have already encountered this kind of uh, dog molecule. <laughs> it looks like that. It's called the nut dot. It is coming from the union of boron trifluoride and ammonia. Because there is a dative bond that is occurring this direction. When forming this adduct, ammonia behaves like a base. And boron trifluoride like an acid, because ammonia is giving a couple of electrons. If we go back to what we have seen before, I go now fast. Ammonia is like this, with a couple of electrons. We said, <clears throat> well, it tends to get an electron out of the water, a proton out of the water, giving it the two electrons, three electrons he has in the valence shell. OK? Ammonia could not be described by the Arrhenius definition. Ammonia could be described by the bronsted lowry definition because it gets the proton but can also be addressed as a base by the Lewis definition because it gives the couple of electrons. So with this definition, we are getting closer and closer to the original molecule. We are defining as a base or as an acid. In order to define something as a base according to this last concept, Lewis, it is sufficient that you have a couple of electrons that you may donate to something. If you do that to a proton, then it's also complying to the bronsted lowry, lowry theory or definition. But in general, having this couple of protons, of electrons, can, is a sort of acidity and can be also exerted without exchanging protons, like in, this, in the formation of this bond. In a way, any dative bond is coming from a base that donates the two electrons and an acid that accepts them to establish a bond. OK? So this is a more generic definition. OK. Terrible paintings, OK. Now, this is much nicer. And this uh, is interesting. 
you consider now aluminum ions. Aluminum, you remember where it is located in the periodic table, it has three tendency to lose three ions, three electrons, and become a three plus ion. We all know that when you, with these ions are inside water, they are not alone. It reminds me of a Stevie Wonder and uh, Michael Jackson song. But I don't want to sing it. Uh, uh, the water molecules are coming all around. You see them? This is a water molecule. And what happens? The oxygen of the water molecule behaves like a base is going to give a pair of electrons to the towards, let's say, the aluminum 3 plus. Positive charge over the ion of aluminum, the aluminum ion, brother. And the oxygen part of the water molecule, that is a lot of electrons, goes there, neutralizing in part locally the positive charge. OK. But you know, it's like distributing the positive charge all around, because you're not neutralizing as a wall. Locally, you show your negative part closer to the positive concentration of charges of the aluminum 3 plus ion. But globally, it's uh, something like this. He is not alone. He is with six water molecules around, but still the overall complex, it's called like that, ionic complex, has three charges, positive charges. These three charges are distributed over a larger mass, the mass of the complex, of the solvated ion. OK. <clears throat> it may happen, and it happens, that this complex ion interacts with water, an additional water molecule in the surrounding, and gives him, look at this, looks like one of those uh, games where you have to see the differences from the left and the right. You may see that what's the difference between the left and the right. Here you, you have one, one proton less. You have one hydrogen atom less. And where has it gone? It has gone here to form the hadronium ion. So what happens? This entire complex, it's better to go back to, this entire complex has behaved like an acid because it has delivered the proton, occasionally it is no more here, to a water molecule that has become a hydronium ion. But this is something that happens. So you see that having an ion in a solution, at the end of the story, may generate a weak acid. Because, don't forget, the, the whoa. No, that is even worse. This. this is an equilibrium reaction. It's not irreversible. It's not going all to the right. It's partially going to the right. But it, you understand now how this can behave like an acid. <clears throat> and you see, uh, we consider this case. And now we're going to talk about this constant that just don't consider it so far. That several ions, metallic ions in solution, get solvated. And these complexes behave like acids that with, with a different strength. The strongest are the iron uh, ions, uh, ferric ions. Uh, Solvated complexes. OK? Uh, 
And this is the amphoteric behavior of aluminum hydroxide. <laughs> well, aluminum hydroxide is a precipitate. Uh, here it is, uh, think of uh, normal water, tap water, which is rather neutral. It has, in other words, it has not many protons or, or oxygen or hydroxide ions. It is not much. It is neutral. I have not defined the pH, but you, I know you know that from previous studies. pH is similar to 7. It's in the middle of the range. If you have aluminum hydroxide in water at pH close to neutral conditions, 7, like normal water from the tap, it does not dissolve. But when you go and put it in a, in a strong acid, like Coca-Cola, or like a sulfuric acid, I have to, from time to time, I have to, to say Coca-Cola. It's uh, my, um, Then it dissolves. And why does it dissolve? Because it gets protons generated by the dissolution of an acid. And what happens is this. Where is it? It goes like this. Mm. Look, <clears throat> it becomes a fully solvated A3 plus ion as the one that we saw before. This is a partially solvated aluminum hydroxide. So aluminum hydroxide is a crystal that embodies some water molecules. Um, when it gets in contact with an acid, the aluminum ions get out of the crystal and gets these nice six uh, water molecules all around. But it goes in the solution also, if you put a base. Why? Because it gets not only three hydroxyls around it, which is the normal case for the aluminum hydroxide salt or precipitate, but it gets a fourth one, like this. By getting a fourth Hydroxyl, it becomes an ion and becomes soluble in the solution. So it can dissolve either if you go to an acid environment or if you go to a basic environment. With a difference, it, they, these two different, the difference is not much because if you see this and you see this, it's not very different. In this case, every water molecule is neutral here. It, it brings just 3 plus as a charge, the aluminum ion. In this case, you see that four of these water molecules have lo lost one of their legs, one of the hydrogen. And they have become OHs, bringing charge to the system, compensating. The three of them do compensate completely the 3 plus charge of the center of it. There is one more that leads to an overall negative ion. Here you have a 3 plus ion. Here you have a negative ion. In both cases, when you have an ion, it gets into water. It dissolves into water. So it behaves like an, a base here or like an acid here, because it has a, an acid here to react with and a base here to react with. You are kindly asked to read this part of the book, because I cannot spend so much time on this. And it, it, with more relaxed uh, environment, you may be drinking a Coca-Cola when, <laughs> when you read this. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have to. Uh, but uh, then you can understand what I, better what I told you. But more or less, it's, it's rather clear, more or less. OK. We have some 10 minutes left, and I, I would like to introduce you 
the ionic product of water. What is this? I will tell you. It's related to the dissociation of water. When water, uh, as we know it, even when it is a pure liquid made of these OH2 molecules, is not completely undissociated. A small bit of it do dissociate, do dissociate. According to this reaction, which is obviously an equilibrium reaction, that is called dissociation of water, water dissociation. As all equilibrium equations, it has an equilibrium constant, that is this k. But more than that, since the dissociation is extremely small, is extremely small, you may consider the product of the equilibrium constant k. This is just uh, something that we you should have uh, now in your minds. And the equilibrium constant k should be the concentration of the hydronium ion times, that is this first product, times the concentration of the second product divided by the square of the water concentration. Okay, This is the equilibrium constant of this equilibrium reaction. But since this is, 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 is a constant, I would say, because the dissociation is so tiny, uh, and it's related to the density of water, that is this one, and to the molar mass of water, that is 18.02, you may say that pure water is water uh, with a concentration of 55.5 moles per liter. It depends on how much water does stay in one liter. It's related to the density. You may disregard the fact that part of it is dissociated. You may consider it completely dissociated. You do a very small mistake. So if you consider water concentration as a constant, it might be good to consider the product of the equilibrium constant of water dissociation and the square power of water concentration, that is this, as a constant. And this new constant is called the ionic product of water. This one, KW. W means, stands for water. And the ionic product, because it's the product of two concentrations, molar concentrations of ions, the hydronium and the hydroxide ions. Hydronium, hydroxide. At 25 degrees C, this constant is this. It's approximately 1, <clears throat> 10 power minus 14. Since in pure water, whenever <clears throat> you produce a proton, you produce an hydroxide, these two concentrations are equal in pure water, equal. So in pure water, you may say that the concentration of H3O plus is 10 minus 7 moles liter. OK? Bene. In a neutral solution, as I just mentioned, these two are equal. In an acidic solution, 
the protons concentration, or better, the hydronium ion concentration overpasses the hydroxide ion concentration. And this is, the, it is just the other way around when you go to basic solution, where the hydroxide ions are more concentrated than the hydronium ions. So you may divide the world into two parts, acid and basic solutions. Acid solution have a lot of protons and very tiny amount of hydroxyl ions. But never no hydroxyl ions. Basic solution have a lot of hydroxyl ions, but never no hydronium ions. Because this is obeying this equilibrium relationship. You may put an enormous amount of protons here, there, because you put hydrochloric acid in large amounts. And you may pump up this concentration a lot. But since this is a constant, there is always a tiny amount of hydroxyl ions there. Okay? Because the product of the protons and the hydroxyl ion concentrations has to be 10 minus 14 if you are in water and you are at 25 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> water, when splitting, does that. So from this, you may also understand why water does split? Two water molecules. It's not a single water molecule doing this. Once again, two molecules because it's, you, we now are in the business. We are now our chemists, more or less. <laughs> we know that chemical reactions are always car accidents, are always collisions. Also, you know, in a water. Uh, in a drinking water uh, glass at 25 degrees, there are these tremendous acci car accidents <laughs> in a tiny bit of them. What is this about? Two mo molecules are hitting each other, and one takes a proton out of the other one. This is the dissociation of water. But you now are talented and you have the know-how to understand that it is not a single molecule of water that splits. Two molecules get in contact. One gets one of the legs of the other. The other one, A, complains, but gets a free couple of electrons there and a negative charge. Of course, in normal conditions, you understand it's not a very frequent thing because the concentration is 10 minus 7 moles a liter, which is a very small amount. Remember, what is the molar concentration of water molecules undissociated in itself? 55.5. If the concentration of the protons or the hydroxyl ions coming out of this dissociation is 10 minus 7, it means that nearly one molecule out of a billion, something like that, is dissociating. More than one million, I would say. <laughs> 10 minus 7. <laughs> so it's a, something that happens only rarely in normal water. But you may push enormous amount of acid there inside and as a consequence water uh, changes and uh, well, the the hydroxyl ions which is this one concentration become smaller and smaller because the product of protons and this has to remain that one it's an equilibrium and so 
last slide for today. We may define the pH, finally, oh. <laughs> the pH is the is minus the, log, the logarithm of the concentration of hydronium. And <clears throat> in neutral water, 25 degrees, the pH is 7, because as we have seen, the concentration of uh, hydronium ion in water is 10 to the minus 7, power minus 7. In an acid environment, you have more protons than that, which means that you have less protons, uh, less hydroxyl ions than 10 minus 7 on the other side. And the pH is below 7. For instance, 10 minus 2 is the concentration of protons, and 10 minus 7 is in neutral condition. So when you have an acid, there is an increase. Don't worry. I mean, it looks like a decrease, but there is a minus over there. So it's an increase of the number of protons. Eh? This is basic uh, mathematics. <laughs> the um, co-logarithm, which means minus the logarithm, is 2 in this case. So, and you know what is the pH of Coca-Cola? <laughs> it's 2 point something. You can get it on the website. <laughs> Two point something, which is uh, enough to decompose meat. You know, if you put a piece of meat in Coca-Cola, it gets uh, li little by little digested. <laughs> okay, you may also define a POH. That is the cologarithm of the OH concentration. From this equation, the equation of the ionic particle water, you may also derive the fact that the sum of the POH and the pH is always 14. Hmm? Fine, it was, it's enough for today. Uh, we are going to end this lesson on Friday. Tomorrow you do additional exercises.